Mark chapter 6, verse 34. How many is happy in Jesus? Amen. Amen. And Jesus, verse 34, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. Because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and he said, This is a deserted place. Already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he, Jesus, answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii and, and, and worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Somebody say, What do you have? Go and see. And when he found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Verse 39. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in in groups on the green grass. Somebody say green grass. So they sat down in the ranks of hundreds and fifties. Say hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he took... He looked up to heaven, he blessed and he broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples to set before them and the two fish and the five and the two fish and he divided them among all and they all ate and were filled. Verse 43, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Somebody say 5,000 men. And immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethesda. And while he sent the multitude away. And those of you who know that story, you know as they got in the boat, they got out in the, in the, in, on the water, and they encountered a cat five, if you will, a hurricane, and it just began to wreck their lives. But Jesus showed up. Aren't you glad Jesus shows up in the midst of your storm? This morning, I want to preach to you from a subject, standing in the storm. Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love for this people. Thank you, God, that you have a plan and a purpose. You have a destiny. This is not as good as it gets. But, Lord, you've got, you're going to teach us to go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. We give you the praise in this place, in Jesus' name. And the church said... Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. When you are seated, can you put your hands together and give him one more praise for the word this morning? For the word. Amen. I love this story. I love uh, anything about Jesus and what he did on this earth with the time that he had. But I want you to, I've preached this passage before, but I think, I feel like the Lord would speak to us in a little bit different way. Because I want you to understand that we live in s- s- storm seasons. How many of you realize that September is the season of hurricanes? Did y'all know that? If you're going to go on a cruise, can I just encourage you, don't go in September. Probably be a bad idea. And right now, the winds and the waves and the storms are shaking. And we have encountered, we've been in, in, impacted, even the state of Texas, as you know, as well as Florida. Because storms do things. Storms affect environment. That is the tool, of one of the tools of the enemy. He wants to affect your environment to put you in a place of desperation. A lot of times when we get desperate, we start reaching out for things we normally wouldn't reach out to. We start depending on things that we normally wouldn't depend on. And I'm talking about Christian folks. Because what used to work ain't working fast enough for us. How many understand what I'm saying? And, and, and so... I've just come to remind somebody in this place what is in the natural storms uh, also can be a type and shadow of what's going on in the spiritual. And, and I believe more now than ever before that the enemy is, he is, he is coming against God's people. He's coming against the church. He's coming against the home. He's coming against families. He's coming against men. He's coming against women. Listen to me, moms and dads. He is battling and doing everything he can to destroy the lives of your teenagers. Your sons and your daughters. But how many knows that when the enemy comes in like a flood, we have a promise that declares and decrees that the Lord, not Bank of America, not a lawyer, not a good preacher, not a good church, but the Lord will raise up a standard against it. Aren't you glad you serve a raising standard God in this place? 
Anything that you encounter, God has the answer. And he's given you the ability to walk through it. It's important to note in this, re- in this story that the Bible says that Jesus uh, recognized that there was 5,000 men. I just want to start there for a moment. Just to let you know, it was like he was saying, I gauge my, the success of my ministry based off how many men I can get to show up. The Bible says 5,000 men showed up. Didn't even mention the women or the children. But just for a moment, can I tell you something? If God can get a hold of the men in this church, the devil can't stop what God will do through the families in this church. And men, as, as, as we stand in the gap, not point at the gap, don't be gappers be, or yappers. Be men and women who will, men who will stand up in the midst of a gap. And a gap just represents a door for the enemy to come in and to cause destruction to your family. How many would let the robber come in your house if you knew he was coming and just say, come on in, take anything you want to? Absolutely not. Come on, someone. Don't act too sanctified in here. I see some gangsters out there. I know y'all packing. If you knew that a robber was coming up in your house, man, you know you would step up and you would fight till the death. Why? Because you want to protect what's in the house. My God, give us men and women who will step up and say, I will fight to the death to protect what's in the house. Not only my natural house, but my spiritual house. My church, my church family. Come on, church, we got to fight together. It's time we quit fighting each other and start fighting together. Somebody give God praise on that right there. Come on. We ain't fighting each other. Fighting the demonic influences. Spiritual. It's a spiritual fight. In verse, verse 36, the Bible says that Jesus is he's preaching to this, this multitude. 5,000 men and many say another 10,000 women. Many would say at least 5,000 sons and daughters. There's, it's hot. The atmosphere is uh, probably a little bit uncomfortable. It's in a desert place. There's, there's no McDonald's. There's no high five. There's, there's no... Uh, uh, there's no pizza, there ain't anything, there's no water that we know of. This, the atmosphere was kind of dry. But Jesus, the word, was speaking. And the people seemed to be drawn to his word more than to what their, their fleshly needs were. Number one, if you're taking notes, the people, we need to be people who choose God's word over bread every day. Recognizing, under the, understanding this, that the natural bread. Anytime we, we, we can get our expectation uh, based on God's word and hungry for God's word over or more so than trying to satisfy this fleshly desire, that's a people that's going to do something for the kingdom. God is looking for men and women who, who the scriptures teach us plain and simple in the book of Matthew chapter 6 and 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. He found a people who were more hungry for his word than, than, than trying to satisfy the hunger of their flesh. Listen, church, if we're going to be a people who are about our father's business, many times we're going to have to sacrifice. Many times we have to put ourselves in a position where his word can change us when we don't want to change. You're not talking to anybody in this place. we got to put ourselves in a position where his word can be a lamp into our feet in a dark place. I'm talking about being in a chaotic moment, being in a position where the storms of life seem to be about ready to take you under, but because of God's word and what his word promises that he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. How many is hungry to be a people for his word more than anything this world can offer you? His word. It's more precious. It's, it's, it's more vital. It, it leads us. It guides us. It directs us. It gives us the instructions that we need. Somebody say it's a road map. Luke chapter 4 and 4 says it like this. But Jesus answered to them saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Can I tell you something? This word is all, if you lose everything and you still got his word, you still got everything that you need. Do you believe that? If you lose it, I don't care if he left you, she left you, if, if the doctors gave you a bad report, I don't care if you lose your job tomorrow. If you hold on to this bread of life, it's not bread to satisfy your fleshly needs. It's bread to take you through the struggles of life, to take you through ups and downs and ins and outs, recognizing though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. His word will be there through the good, through the bad, through the ups and through the downs. And when I don't have anybody else to turn to, I've got his word for heaven and earth. 
earth's going to pass away, but his word is forever settled in heaven. Give him a good shout of praise in this house this morning. They were hungry for his word. The next thing I notice in verse 38, Jesus, after being encountered or questioned by the disciples, because the disciples were looking for him to do something, other than themselves, which is kind of interesting because a lot of times, like Brother Brandon was talking about during worship, we are asking God for things that he's already done for us, and he's asking the question, when are you going to get up and use what I've already given you? And so it's important that we don't get caught up on what uh, we think God's supposed to do. When he already, Jesus said it on the cross, he said, it is finished. We either believe it or we don't. We'll either accept it and walk in it or we won't. But I got news for you. In verse 38, Jesus, after they came to him and he said, you feed them, you take care of it, as if to say, I've already given you what you need. Have faith and walk, it, walk in it. How many needs a little bit more faith? I know we do because we've been talking about it just about every Sunday. We need a little bit more faith. All of us. We, got, we, we need to be stretched. Some of us need faith to step out and say, you know what? I want to commit to the street ministry. I'll come help make bologna sandwiches. I'll come help pass out tracts and tell people that Je- the people who don't know Jesus that Jesus loves them. Listen to me. I, I, was, uh, I was eating dinner the other night with my family, and, and I was at Saltgrass, that Holy Ghost filled place. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and we was having a sanctified meal. And after we ordered, I, I never put my wallet in my pocket. I always carry it because it's too fat. And, and so I had it with my phone, and I set it down on this little bar behind me because it was tight, and, but it was right there beside me. And, and this, this, all of a sudden, we had ordered, and we was laughing and cutting up, and I, I looked back. We had noticed this woman was looking at Brandon, which I thought she was checking him out, you know. <laughs> Come on, Brandon, you know you got a little bit excited. <laughs> Before we knew it, she walked out the door. And as she's walking out the door, I didn't know she was checking him out. But I, I noticed she looked back at me twice. And I was like, well, I must be look, looking good too. No, we started laughing. was thinking maybe well, she had a date show up and he, he saw her and she left. We didn't know. And, and uh, does that mean? I'm sorry. Anyway, she comes back in and she sits in the right same spot. And at the time she sits back down, I look back and I see my wallet's gone. My phone's still there, but my wallet's gone. And I start thinking, what in the world? And so I jump up. We, we try to get, get the video real quick because we want to know who did this. This young lady looks like, and all the things that had been happening, it looked like she had, she had taken the wallet. And sure enough, she gets up. She walks out. The cops show up immediately. Right before, I go tackle her because I was about to in Jesus' name. And, and the cops show up. And sure enough, she, she took my wallet. And uh, she gave it back. And he said, do you want to press charges? I said, no. But I do want to talk to her. Because I think if the enemy's going to steal something, he ought to have to face you face to face. So I, I, I went up to her, I said, and, she, and she started crying. I'm so sorry. I'm 25 years old, and I've been here. She was giving me her whole story. I said, honey, just stop. I said, you don't have to confess to me. Uh, first of all, I'm a pastor of a church, and I've I, I, I seen all, pretty, pretty much everything and anything that you, that you probably could tell me you've been through. But here's the ultimate thing. For, the, as long as you keep making bad choices, you're going to keep getting bad results. And church, I don't want you to know today, if you keep making bad choices, you're going to keep getting bad results. If you're asking God for something he's already given you, start walking in what he's given you and have authority in it, recognizing you're a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you have a right to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You have a right to speak to that demonic spirit and say, Satan, not in my house. Ain't going to listen to that. Ain't going to go there. My children ain't going to talk like that. And ain't may not be good, but ain't is good enough when Jesus is all up in it. Some to give him praise that he's a restorer and he's a healer he's a deliverer if you'll walk in that power and that authority long story short I laid hands on that girl I said I'm going to pray for you right now and she began to weep we started praying and wouldn't you know it I said say this with me because I wanted the devil to confess I said say this with me say Jesus forgive me of all my sins I'm a sinner. And she repented right there in front of the cops. And the cops thought I was crazy. I know it might be crazy, but I got news for you. If the devil's going to do something crazy, how many believe the church ought to start doing some other things a little bit more crazy? Amen. 
the cop started checking her. I had my wallet. He started checking her purse, and he pulled out one of my credit cards. I said, girl, I just because I missed it don't mean authorities ain't going to miss it. I mean, he's glad that when we miss things, the, the, the high authority catches it, right? So Jesus says, you feed them. They say, what do you want us to do? You want us to take matters in our own hands? And Jesus said, yeah, actually I do. But uh, number two, if I gave you something, I would say miracles always start with what you have. Miracles always start with what you have. The first thing out of Jesus' mouth after they gave excuses why they couldn't do what they, what they wanted to do was what do you have? When you recognize what you have, then God can multiply it. Many times we focus more on what we don't have than what we do have. And we're saying, well, God, if I had this, I could do that. But God's saying, why don't you use what you've got and I will take you to a new and a fresh place and you will do more than you ever thought you could do. But you got to use what you got first. We're asking God for more and we can't handle what we've got. Some of us are asking God for more money, but we can't handle the money we've got. Some of us are asking for another husband. You can't handle, oh, come on, somebody. Some of us are asking for all these things, and God says, use what you got. Elijah, in the book of Kings, the Bible says he showed up, and there's this woman picking up sticks. And she was getting ready to bake a cake, and her and her son was going to die. She was a widow woman. He shows up. He's a man of God. He's a prophet. He shows up. He says, hey, woman, could you bring me some water? She said, absolutely, because there was plenty of water, but there wasn't a lot of food. It was a famine. And the Bible says he begins to minister to her, and he says, hey, by the way, on your way into the house, could you bake me a cake? Her first excuse was, hey, I've only got a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. And then we're, me and my son are going to eat this cake and we're going to die. What was she doing? She was looking at what she had as not enough instead of recognizing what she had was more than enough in the right hands. And if we'll start putting what we have, I'm talking about your bank account, sir. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your health. Come on, someone. We must put everything we have in the hands of God. That's called covenant. Somebody say covenant. If you can't be a Jesus freak and say you're a Jesus lover and you're all about Jesus, but he can't have your checkbook. Just stepped on somebody's toes. That's okay. You can't say that you're in love with Jesus and everything you have belongs to him and you're withholding all your sickness and saying, well, God can fix them, but he can't fix me. Believe it or not, there's people in here who have more faith for other people than they have for themselves. I got news for you. We are a people who have been created in the image and in the likeness of God. And he wants us to have more than enough. Paul said it like this, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. If you want God to start supplying your needs, start using what he's given you so that he can send a multiplication like you've never seen before. Somebody give him praise on credit right now. Come on. Use what you have. I'm reminded also of another woman who Elisha, Elijah's predecessor, Elisha showed up one day to this widow woman and she was in kind of in the same position same predicament she was dealing with some hard moments and he encountered her she, she said hey I'm fixing to die I can't pay the creditors they're going to take my sons and she gives the same excuse after he asked the questions what do you have in the house she said I just got a little bit of oil notice what he did he says Take what you got. Go borrow from your neighbors their empty vessels. Listen to me. All of us are vessels used or ready to be used, should be ready to be used in the kingdom. And you may not be as full as you need to be. You may be, you know what, you might be dry as a bone. But if you'll get in the right atmosphere, like she got these, she went and borrowed these vessels. 
She closed the door, and the Bible says the little bit of oil that she had, she began to pour into those vessels, and her son brought another vessel. She poured into that vessel, filled it up. Her son brought another vessel, poured it up. And before you know it, she had 20, 30, 40. I don't know how many she got, but as much faith as she had to bring back home with her with those empty vessels. The Bible says everything that she had need of was taken care of. I'm just telling you, if we will use what we've got, he will give us in an abundance to, of overflow for our families and for our lives. Do you believe it in this place? Moses, what do you have in your hand? I've called you by name. I know who you are. I've got a plan and I've got a purpose for your life. But God, I can't speak. I stutter. I don't know how to communicate to people. Because when I get around people, I get scared. Yeah, because Moses had some weaknesses. And one was his speech. What do you have, Moses? I got a stick. Stretch out your rod. You know what he did? He used that rod. One time God told him to throw it down. It turned to a snake. Ate up all the other snakes. The pharaohs. He picked it back up and turned back into a rod. Moses used that rod to stretch forth and the water spread. And they walked across on dry land. Moses used that rock, uh, that, that, that rod, and he, he, he hit a rock and water came out of it. What are you saying, Pastor Dan? I'm saying if you'll use what you've got, God will multiply it by faith, but you've got to trust him. He's already given you everything that you need. You've got to believe it. You've got to walk in it. You've got to declare it over your life. Verse 44, women and children weren't included. I want you to notice that here for a moment. Who was there? 5,000 men. The Bible is very specific to to declare who was counted. Number three, write this down. God uses people that that other people don't count. God uses people that other people don't count. The Bible says that there was 5,000 men. It's interesting that the young man who was used for the five loaves and the two fish didn't even get counted. He didn't even get noticed. You ever known somebody that won't do nothing because they don't get noticed? Well, if they let me up on the stage and let me sing the solo, I might do that. That's not the kind of spirit God's looking for. He's looking for men and women, boys and girls who will say, God, whether people know me or not, I just want to be used by you. I want to be a servant. I want to be humble. I want to be broken and spilled out for your presence. Come on, somebody. God don't need no big eyes. He is the eye. He's the great I am. He's the rose of Sharon, the fairest of 10,000. He is the great I am. He's everything you need. And all he's looking for is men and women to say, I'll be a servant for you. Humility will take you higher than you've ever thought you could go. And pride will drop you faster than you've ever thought you could drop. He's looking for men, for women. In spite of the fact that we don't feel counted by others, how many is thankful that he's counted us? I'm glad one, one day when no one else counted me, Jesus still saw me and he counted me. He, he said, you count You've got a purpose for my kingdom. You fit specifically and strategically right in the midst of a a puzzle called life. And I want to use you for your life. Aren't you glad that God has counted you for the kingdom in this place? Let me just sit here for a moment. Some of you, I think, feel like you can't be counted because of where you've been or what you've done. And I just want you to know that's the lie of the devil. You've allowed shame and condemnation to rule over you. And I want you to understand, when men don't count you, God still counts you. When men don't see good in you and don't see worth in you, God sees priceless inside of you. He sees value inside of you. But I don't look like everybody else and I can't do it like Brother Jojo and I ain't got the looks like Sister Susie. Who gives a flip? You've been made in the image and the likeness of Christ. If any man be in Christ Jesus, all things are passed away. But I ain't been where they've been and I ain't done what they've done and I've done a lot more bad than they've done. Who cares? Jesus said, I've cast your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. Who am I talking to in this sanctified church this morning? God's counted you. He's got a plan for you, but all you got to do
do is say, yes, Lord. Somebody say yes. yes. Say it again. Say yes. yes. If you'll say yes to him, he'll say yes to you. I'm preaching today. I'm standing before you today because he counted me. When nobody else would count me, he did. And I believe I'm looking at you this, in this place this morning. I see mighty women, mighty men of God. Mighty warriors. And you might not have known it when you came in here, but I want you to know it today before you leave. You've been counted. God's included you in His plan. God has hand-picked you to get the job done. Somebody give God praise in this place. Come on. There's a miracle that's needing to take place. The atmosphere is people are hungry. It is hot. Probably women, pregnant, babies, crying. People, they are hungry, fleshly, in the natural, but they have been being fed by the Word of God. Jesus, the Word, speaking. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was speaking, and it was satisfying. But there was a miracle that was needed. People needed to be fed in the natural. The Bible says... Jesus looks at the women and at the children. And though he does, he, he, he recognizes in verse 4, in verse 40, Jesus slows it all down. Now you would think it would get sped up. But the first thing Jesus says is, okay, we need a miracle. Slow it all down. Number four, because the best miracles take time. The best miracles take time. What do you mean, Pastor Darren? He slowed it all down. He said, hey, I want you to have all 20,000 or so people to sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. You know how long that would have taken? You know how long it takes for us to get y'all organized and feed y'all in the little kitchen we got back there? A few hundred we got of you? Imagine 20,000 people. He, he said, set them down in groups of hundreds and fifties. What was he saying? He was saying, slow it down. Get some structure. Get some organization. Let's be able to, if they're ever going to receive the miracle I'm about to do in their life, they have to be able to handle it. For some of you, the miracle that you've been asking for, you're not ready to handle. It's quiet. I'm glad you're listening. Church, if we're going to do what God's called us to do, what He's called us to do, we ain't ready. How many is ready to get prepared? How many is ready to get structured properly, organized properly? You, you, my Lord, if, if, if uh, Anna, if, if I brought you up here and I jumped in your arms, you'd probably fall, wouldn't you? Why? Look how little she is. I'm a little bit bigger than you. Why? Because you're not made to carry this load. Same thing with the church. If we're not made to carry what we're asking God to give us, that's crazy. You know why? Because we're going to crumble and fall. And we'll be doing it for ourselves so we can say, look at what we've done. Look at what we've got. And sometimes the Spirit of God has to speak to pastor. Sometimes he's got to speak to you and other things. But over this church, God will speak to me and say, you know what? We've got to restructure some things. We need to be able to handle what, what, what God has in store for us in days, weeks, months, years to come. I do believe, and I told you this at the very beginning, that, that it, it, God has put an anointing on this body, upon this people, upon this staff and this leadership to expedite what used to take a year is going to take six months. What used to take five years is going to take one year. Come on, somebody. we got to have faith to believe because we're running out of time. This is the day that the Lord hath made. How many is ready to rejoice and be glad in what we have right now? Somebody give him praise that right now is good for what he's doing in our life. Right now. Sometimes you got to slow things down. But the best miracles, the best miracles take time. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says it like this. For you have need of patience. And that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. How many is thankful we have a promise in Him? We live in a microwave generation. But we serve a crockpot God. That's the old saying. And sometimes He just wants to have a simmer. And that's hard for me. I don't know if it's hard for you, but that's hard for me because I like to get things done. 
I like to move. I like to make it happen. But sometimes the best miracles, what God wants to, the greatest thing He wants to do in your life, it may take some time, but how many knows if we'll be in His timing, it'll be the right timing. Amen. The Bible says in verse 41, Jesus takes the bread. Ethan, give me that wonder bread there. How many knows a wonder? It's a wonder we're even here today. It's a wonder Jesus even took us in his hand and said, I can use you. I wanted some bread that wasn't cut, but the dollar store didn't have it, so I had to use what I had. Come on, somebody. So the Bible says that Jesus said, bring me what you've got. He takes it in his hand, and he begins to pray. This is very interesting. Because as he begins to pray, he takes it in his hand. First of all, I want you to understand there was still five loaves and two fish. Even though it was in Jesus' hands, the number didn't change. We think that if, if it's in his hands, that's enough. But in this story, we are learning something different. The first key is him putting it in his hands. Then the Bible says that Jesus blessed it. He's praying over it. Lord, thank you for this food. Thank you for the nourishment that's going to take place in my body and over all these people. He starts praying. Can I ask you something? Or can, I, can you write this down? Number five. Jesus blessed what was not enough. I want you to notice that. Jesus blessed what was not enough. And my question is, why? Because in the natural, we would say, why would he pray over something that ain't enough? But in the, in the spiritual, he was trying to teach us that just because it's not enough to us doesn't mean it's not enough to him. We have to learn how to, one, put it in his hands. Two, we've got to trust him to bless it even when we don't think it's what we need. Come on, somebody. When we, even though we don't think it's what it, we need, if it's in his hands, it can still be blessed. And the story dramatically changes after he blesses it. Five loaves, two fish. It was well under the amount. The key to seeing what you and I need uh, uh, that is not enough being multiplied into more than enough is being thankful for what we do have. The key to seeing what, our, what we call our lack, blessed, is we must learn how to be thankful for what we've got already. Some people ain't thankful because they're always trying to get more thinking that will make them thankful. Are you with me this, in this place? More doesn't pr produce thankfulness. The fact that it's in his hands and that God has already called it blessed. Lord, I'm thankful. It's not, uh, it's not the best job, but I'm thankful I got a job. At least I'm able to pay my bills. Lord, I'm thankful. It's not the best car and I got to put six, oil, six quarts of oil every 16 miles. But thank you for the car you've given me. Lord, I'm thankful. My body don't feel as good as it did when I was 20. And I know I'm 65, but at least I don't feel like I'm 85. Come on, somebody. Be thankful because it's blessed. It might not seem like it's enough, but it's still blessed. In the next moment of the story, things just shift. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, I'll give you some scripture. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Be grateful when what, what you have is not enough, knowing that with that, God can produce more than enough. The Bible says that the blessing, verse 6, Jesus takes the blessing and then he does something that shifts the whole story. He takes the blessing and he breaks it. He breaks it. It's blessed. Surely it's more than enough, but it still ain't enough. Still just five, fish, five loaves and two fish. It's in your Bible. Nothing happened. It's in his hands. Still just five loaves, two fish. 
And then the Bible says that Jesus breaks the bread. And in the the breaking came the blessing. It wasn't until he broke it, something shifted in the atmosphere. And I need you to write this down in verse 6, or, or, or number 6. The blessing is always in the breaking. And if you want God to bless your life, you have to let him break you first. Break your will. Break your desire. Break your emotions. Break your shame. Come on. Break the condemnation over you. Break your mindset. There, you must be broken if you want God to bless you. Brokenness is not God destroying you. Brokenness is God trying to bless you. When was the last time you put yourself in a position for God to break you? Even if it meant that you lost this or you lost that. You know what my prayer is on a consistent basis? God, make me effective. I don't want to just be a man who goes through the routines. I've been praying that since I was a teenager. God, make me effective. Make me a one who can impact my atmosphere. And I've gone through brokenness of loss. I've gone through brokenness of feeling us left alone. I've gone through brokenness feeling like I was fighting this battle all by myself. And somebody in here has too. And you're looking for the blessing. And God told me to tell somebody, start searching for the breaking. Breaking is not a bad thing. It's the best thing. It don't feel good in the natural. But when God's breaking you, you know he's preparing you for something you can never do on your own. When you allow him to break you, you know that he is strategically ready, getting ready to position you to take you higher than you've ever been before. Listen, church, it's in the breaking. My God, Lord, break this church. Break our hearts. Break our hearts for you, Lord. Break our hearts for the lost and for the dying and Lord, that we wouldn't throw condemnation and shame on people who don't look like us or act like us. But God, that we would send out a love, a a word of compassion. Lord, that we would open up our coats and show our scars. Because I've been broken, but I'm still blessed. You may have lost it all, but if you still got Jesus, you've got all that you need. The blessing is in the breaking. And the Bible says that he broke it. When he broke it, he gave it. Stand up. Start breaking some pieces off and just start giving it. He gave it to his disciples. Help me out. Just break it and give it. And as long as he kept breaking it, he kept blessing it. What are you doing? You're supposed to keep breaking it. Get up. Get up. Hurry. Get up. No, you're my disciple. I want you to break it. Come on. He broke it and he gave it. Bobby, come on. You do it. Break it. I didn't say eat it. Just just give it to him. Stand up. Come on. Break it. And every time he broke it. Come on, Brennan. You better break it and give it. Every time he broke it, multiplication took place. Every time it broke More people, even if you drop it, pick it back up, keep breaking it. Because the blessing's in the breaking. And the more it got broken, what was little (laughs) became enough. What wasn't enough in the natural, because it had been blessed. He was thankful for what he had. Keep breaking it. And, And the more he broke it, the more it was blessed. It can be blessed. But how many understands the more you allow him to break it, the more it can be blessed? In other words, it's it's one thing to be broken on Sunday morning. It's another thing to let him break you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday too. Come on, don't don't get up from the altar. Don't leave worship. Don't leave praise. Don't leave this atmosphere and say, no, God, you can't touch me anymore. No, God, that hurts too much. The moment you you remove yourself from a place of him breaking you is the moment your blessing stops. Are you getting this in this place this morning? And the Bible says, after everyone was filled, 
Now listen, God is a good cook. And he knows how to cook just enough. Now some of you ladies who, who, do a, who cook for your family and then you got like five days worth of leftovers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Now at my house we ain't got that. We got what we got and we're going to eat it and it's gone. You better get the broccoli while you can because it ain't going to last. Daddy don't know how to do all the measuring and stuff. I can't grill some crazy chicken though. You better look out. The Bible says after it was blessed and after it was broken, there was 12 baskets left over. Now this is what kind of blows me, throws me off because even in the wilderness with the children of Israel, when God was feeding them with manna, he, he, if, if you were to pick up more than what you needed, the manna off the ground, y'all know, y'all know what story I'm talking about? If you would pick up more than what you needed because you didn't have faith to believe God was going to give it to you for tomorrow, so many of them would do that and they'd stick it in their tents and the next morning they'd find worms in that manna because it was showing God that they didn't trust Him to provide not only yesterday but something as good or better tomorrow. Okay? See, your faith works hand in hand with you allowing God to break you. you don't tell me that you trust God to break you and then to bless you if you don't have faith. You got to have faith. In the first place, you got to do number one is you got to let him, you got to put yourself in his hand. For some of you, you got to start with, because you, you still got the first dollar bill you ever made, you got to start with your giving. You got to let go. You got to trust God with everything that you've got. In many ways, money becomes like mammon to us, to people. It's, it's controlled us. That's why the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money. It's the love of it because we think we'll never get enough of it. But listen, as long as you put it in God's hands and you let him bless it and then you allow him to break you, he will distribute. He'll get it to you, but he wants to get it through you. That's, what, that's the mentality we've got to start having. Not only with our finances, but my God, with the Jesus that we say we've got inside of us. When was the last time you shared the gospel? Pastor Darren, that's a little bit harsh. It ought to be because we're running out of time and people need Jesus. That young lady that stole my wallet, she needed Jesus just as much as the next person. And She ain't got to be in church to get Jesus. It needs to be somebody like me who professes to be a pastor, professes to be a preacher. Listen, I don't care if you're a preacher or not. You are the saved, the sanctified, the filled with the Holy Ghost. You're professing that you, are, you live for Jesus. You're supposed to be a light in a darkened world. And light can overtake, but we've got to let it shine. Somebody give Jesus praise. That I'm, say, I'm ready. Tell him, say, I'm ready. All right, I'm going to hurry. I'm done. I'm going to close with this. The Bible says, write this down, number seven. This was my seventh point. The blessing, never forget this, the blessing is meant to pass through your hands, not from your hands. There's a difference. The blessing passed through the disciples' hands. It wasn't from their hands. Do you understand me? It's very important that you notice that. Because the moment you think what you've got came from you is the moment you're going to lose what you got. The moment we think, church, that we've got it all figured out, and our, if we get this program and we get this person and we put this here and we make this and we got this, we will lose everything we've got. This pastor right here is focused on getting what's in God's hands through our hands so that we can do what he's called us to do effectively. Never lose that mentality. And last but not least, the Bible says after they picked up the 12 fragments or the 12 baskets, he tells them to put it in the boat. Go to the other side. They grab the leftovers. I'm talking about half-eaten fish. Talking about half-eaten bread. I mean, it's probably kind of nasty. It's greasy. Fish is good when you first take it out of the fryer, but my God, don't, don't give it to me three days later. So they take these 12 packs. <laughs> they take these finger baskets and, and they, they stick it in the boat. There's a reason why it's in the boat. Jesus knows, they don't know, but they are about to encounter a storm like they've never seen before. 
How many understands that there are things that you and I are going to face, but we still have to hold on to his promises, knowing that he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us? There are some people who won't even get out of bed the next morning, tomorrow, because without walking in fear, because they're afraid of what's about to happen to them. But listen, church, that's not faith. We've got to trust the Lord to provide, to, to meet every need, to show up and fight our battles. We're not doing this on our own. We're doing this according to his will and for his purpose. The Bible says that they get in the boat and they encounter the storm and the winds are blowing and the, the water is splashing in and, 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 and it's getting very chaotic and, and all of a sudden when they feel like things are about to couldn't get any worse they see this ghost walking that they perceived as a ghost and is actually Jesus. And the Bible says in the midst of the storm and the fear that overtook them as they are, some of them just feel like this is it, it's over, life's about to be gone. Scripture teaches that in the midst of that storm before Jesus showed up, Mark 6 and 52, just a few more verses past our text, it says, for they, the disciples, considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. We have to learn how to tell our future about our past. Let me explain. Their future, their present circumstance was in a storm. And fear overtook them. And some of you are in storms right now. You're dealing with something that nobody has the answers to. You don't, have, you don't have the answers to it. You don't, have, you don't see any way to, to get out of the circumstance that you're in. But there is something from your past that you need to be reminded in. Recognizing that if he was for you then, he's still for you today. They should have looked back and said, oh, guys, remember the 12 baskets that we picked up? Do you remember the 20,000 people that Jesus multiplied and caused what was not enough to become enough of, and that he took five loaves and two fish? Do you remember? Surely God could get us out of this hurricane. Surely he could get us out of this chaotic situation. Surely. But they considered not. You know what they considered? They considered the storm. They didn't consider the miracle that had just taken place. All I'm telling you today, it is if, if you focus your, your attention on the storm and you forget what God's already brought you through, you're giving the enemy one more tool to use against you. But if sometimes you just need to reach back in that bag of miracle blessing that you've received in the past and say, you know what? God did it for me then. He's going to do it for me again. God's brought me through more God brought me through more stuff than this. He's never left me. He'll never forsake me. He's been good to me. He's been so faithful and I trust him. And I know I'm going through a storm right now and weeping's enduring for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. You know, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You know if God be for you, no devil in hell can be against you. If you know it, remind yourself, shake yourself and say, devil, God's for me. I'm not by myself. And though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. Somebody put your hands together and give him praise that he's a God that you can be reminded that your past can be better in the future. Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Standing in the storm. You stand in the midst of chaos. You don't throw you don't fall down. You don't throw your hands up and give up. You don't walk away from the church. You don't walk away from your family. You stand. The more you stand, the sooner you'll see the sunshine come through the clouds. How many needs a miracle today? 